Yeah. Welcome to the very first episode of Tiff Talks Podcast. My name is Ferris C. I am the co-host of Tiff Talks Podcast, and we wanted to switch things up. We wanted you to get to know Tiffany Marie Davis on another level. We're going to get raw, real, and juicy. So we're so excited to have you guys here. Thank you so much for coming along, and welcome to the podcast. Tiffany, what's up, girl? What's up? I love it. I just, I'm so excited to have you on here, Ferris. It's been a long time coming. I know, so, I know. Ready, guys. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. So, you know, like we said, this is the first episode and we wanted to do things a little bit differently. We wanted to, you know, I guess maybe I wanted to. <laughs> um, I want everyone listening and anyone watching the replay over on YouTube to really get to know who Tiffany Marie is. And she was formerly known as Boydston, you know, in if you guys really know who she is. And uh, she's been recently married, so it's Davis now. So we're doing a lot of brand changes with that. But, um, you know, I really want to just jump this off. I mean, are you ready? I'm ready, girl. All cool. right. So, I mean, I guess the first and foremost thing is who is Tiffany Marie? Who are you? I mean, take it back to childhood from the very beginning. Where do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean, I was a really happy, joyful child. I was raised in a single parent home. Uh, you know, my mom at the time just did the absolute best that she could. I, you know, being older, I, I really, because there was a time in my life where I had a lot of resentment towards it. And, you know, we'll get there in a minute. But my mom was a single mom, so it did require her to work a lot, you know, and, but I do know that the one thing that she always focused on was my schooling. I went to a Catholic school from kindergarten until eighth grade. Um, you know, my mom like literally put me in every sport, acting classes, everything from kindergarten on. She always just knew something was special about me. And that, I mean, I guess every parent does, right? It's like, you're special. <laughs> and so at that point though, but my mom just said I had so much energy and I just had this passion for life. And she kind of, in a sense, didn't know what to do with me. So I was in martial arts. I was in acting. I was in um, softball, you know, and so volleyball, basketball, all of it, just to kind of like find, I guess, my niche at that time. And so fast forwarding into who I was like around 13, you know, my mom, we probably moved every year, at least once or twice from the eight since I could remember until I was 13. Um, and actually, you know, something happened. I'm not really sure because at 13 years old, you know, your parents only tell you so much. Um, but during that transition of my life, um, my, let me back it up just a couple of years before 13, I was somewhat raised by my grandparents. My grandfather was my hero. Um, I was with him a lot during the weekends because again, single mom, mom needs a break, but I never met my father ever. And Ooh, all right. So we're going to get the dad in here a little bit then. Yeah. And so I didn't meet my father until I was 11 and for a reason. My grandfather was my father figure. I, I never knew why my parents split up. My mom didn't talk about it. It wasn't something I don't even think she was ready to really get into because, you know, it's just like, what do you tell your child if how you got a divorce and, you know, like, where is my dad? I, I, I just, that's all I knew. So I don't even think I really asked. That's kind of more of a question for her, but not having a father present, my grandfather was a father figure to me. Um, my uncle at the time as well, uh, my cousin's dad, we actually did a lot of sports together. So at the age of 11, my father was actually introduced into my life when my grandfather passed away. I felt, I think that my mom felt that it was important for me to have a father figure at that point and, and maybe like start opening that door when my grandfather passed away. Maybe she thought, you know, you possibly were mature enough maybe to open that relationship, you think? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> all right. All right. I mean, I'm following along and I'm sure we'll do, you know, a whole episode on, you know, divorce and things like that. But, you oh, know, sure. I, I get it. Keep going. Yeah, it was a really tough one because, again, you're this little girl and then you're meeting this strange man that's like your dad, you know. And when I met him, it was like, oh, my gosh, he is so cool. You know, he took me to Las Vegas where I reside now. It's so saw. funny. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like my parents, though. It was like, hey, we're moving to Vegas. So I get it. 
I know you go from, I'm from Sacramento, California. Um, that's where I went to school and then pretty much, you know, on the weekends raised in uh, Fairfield, Vacaville area. Um, so we went to Napa a lot. And so anyway, long story short, I came to Vegas at 11. Um, I'm surprised my mom even trusted the fact that, you know, you can take your daughter out of the state for the first time meeting. Um, I'm okay, obviously. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I can't really speak for everybody, but there is, I mean, I guess I'll just put it out there. There's a majority of people that are not okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, yeah. And it's, you just, you don't know, you know? And so, you know, coming here at 11, I saw these big lights. I met an entire family I didn't know. Um, and I thought like, it was the coolest experience. Like imagine coming into the city of lights. I remember circus circus. And then, um, you know, I was with my dad for the next couple of months and it was definitely a transition. Like I was, you know, a little, in a sense, like terrified. I had, um, you know, stepbrothers and stepsisters at the, or a stepbrother and a stepsister at the time. And so, and I'm an only child. Uh, and then coming back to California, I repeated my school year. Summer came again, 12 years old, went to visit my dad again for a couple of weeks. Um, but that time is where I got to see the reality of really like the environment um, and I don't know if I was a good kid or a bad kid, mm. but I, you know, <laughs> I, I kept my head in the books for the most part, but I started to like, in a sense, not want to go back again because, um, and I don't know if you guys know where Las Vegas is, but my grandparents at the time lived on 28th street and it was at 28th and D street. Ooh, that's over on the east side. I mean, it's, it's in the sense, like consider the projects here. And I didn't realize that at 12 years old, I thought like, you know, it was the first time I saw someone do drugs on the corner of the street. It was the first time that, you know, I was like, like, where am I at? I'm, I'm in a foreign place. And, you know, I was taught like no drugs, no this, no that. I went to a Catholic school, you know, pretty straight edge family that just totally into academics and sports. Um, so you, you know, would say it was like a culture shock kind of. It was kind of like, whoa, uh, like what's uh, going on here? Like non-negotiable culture shock. I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Now I'm like getting to a point where I don't want to come back. <laughs> right. I mean, I was scared. I was like, I, these, yeah. I was just scared. I'm a little girl in the middle of, you know, this environment. Anyway, so I go back home and then I start to retaliate a little bit. Like I'm starting to create like frustration and anger. And again, as a child, I didn't know what that was. And at that point, like now I'm just searching for love and like stability. Right. And so mm. I, I come back home finish my school year out again. Um, something happened that I will never know the answer to. Uh, my mom was actually remarried at the time. Um, and I don't want to get too deep here. It's really not my business to be sharing, but right, right. No, it didn't work out. And my mom didn't know what she was going to do. So my dad was a little bit more stable in Las Vegas. And she just asked like, Hey, you know, on the next summer, right. Thinking it was only going to be a couple of weeks. We get a phone call. And I'm sitting with my stepmom in the car and I have all of my bags packed up and she looks at me and she goes, looks like you're, you're staying for a little bit. And I'm like, what? And so I get on the phone with my mom. I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, Hey, you know, you're going to come back home. You're going to get your stuff, but you're going to stay with your dad for a little bit until I can figure this out. And I'm like, my whole world was over. My friends were gone. My, my family was gone, you know, and like I had just lost my grandfather at 11. I just entered the stranger into my life. And then now Gosh, everything. That's tough, man. That's tough. Yeah. And then, you know, everything's gone. Like literally life yeah. as you knew it was gone. Mm -hmm. And, or as I knew it, I should say. So I don't know if I'm relating to anyone out there, but I mean, a major part of me sharing this part of my life is it was a huge part of who I am today. Like, had I not gone through that experience, you know, there's, there's been a lot of challenging times that's even led up to, to now where I'm glad I had that strength and, and, you know, resiliency to get out of that situation. But, you know, it's what almost like you took all of that hardship, heartache, rebellion, all of that, and you turn that into you know, what you're doing now. And, you know, it definitely speaks to me. I mean, a lot of the things that you're saying, I'm like, wow, that's super similar to what happened to my story. And it's, I think a lot of people will relate, like there are some 
you know, treacherous things that, you know, we may go through as kids that really ultimately is the deciding factor of who we become, yeah. who we surround ourselves with, who we're learning from, where our morals come from. And, you know, I just got to give it up to you because that's really difficult. You know, you're living a certain life, you're going down this path, you're like, hey, everything's gravy. And then it's like, whoop, okay, something traumatic happens. Grandpa's gone, rest in peace. And you meet dad. And I mean, it's cool, but you weren't really planning on being there full time. So, you yeah. know, that that's really massive. And I hope you guys are really listening. You know, she's, <laughs> I love Tiff, you guys. Uh -huh. And she's been through a lot of stuff, you know, so it's like, if you see her today and, you know, you see her on social media and Instagram, like, you know, we all have a story and I'm just so glad that you were able to kind of open up to our listeners and everybody and, and, you know, share that little bit. And, you know, we don't want to go too deep because like you said, it's really not your place to go on certain things, which I yeah. respect. Um, but, uh, with those struggles, you know, since you had those as a kid, how do you think that compares to your life now? Like how does that, does any of that stuff kind of come up for you a little bit? Do you use oh, it as yeah. fuel? Like, what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, to kind of rewind a little bit with just kind of capping that story <laughs> is when I got that phone call, I still had to go back home and get my stuff. Can you imagine a 13 year old girl? or boy, <laughs> getting this news, like what is the automatic thing a child's gonna do? Rebel, retaliate, and express themselves from a place of anger. <laughs> right, 100%, I agree. I don't even think you know this, Ferris, but I'm gonna share. So I uh, get back home, and you know, to this day, I still wanna reach out to my, my then stepfather, um, he was incredible. He, from 11 until 13, he got my head back, you know, straight in the books. And he really helped me with my academics. You know, he went to West Point. He was an incredible man. You know, it was just so unfortunate. It didn't work out. It was a blended family. And, you know, it can be really tough with kids. And it's something that at now I'm learning <laughs> what that, oh, that yeah. can That's be if you, you know, um, so anyway, like that's a whole nother episode, but, uh, <laughs> going back then, I just remember like walking in, like why, like why my whole life was actually finally stable. He was an, you know, them together was great. My schools, my schooling was back on track, you know, being with a single mom, she could only do so much for my academics. So the fact that like, you know, night homework, like there was a lot of times I was teaching myself and. I, there was a lot of times that I just had to figure out, you know, answers and questions. It was a miracle that I was such a, a good student, you know, and, and then, you know, come into high school, I was starting to flunk because I didn't have like that, that stability. And then that's where my stepfather came in and he really like sat down with me, did homework with me. And I don't think I ever like thanked him for that. Like there's times where I'm like, I just want to thank him because that is when I feel like he was the one who really helped me understand, like, you can do it. Like you really can do it. Yeah, and amazing. yeah. And so anyway, so I get home <laughs> and my mom taught me how to drive a stick shift and she carpooled with my, uh, my then stepdad. And so she left the car in the garage and I was home by myself packing. No, you took it for a spin, didn't you? Oh, I took it for a very bad spin. I call you guys this little rebel. <laughs> I call my best friend. And get, I'm 13 years old, everyone. Okay. I, the fact that I didn't hey, get remind you at 13, like we were doing all the things. Okay. <laughs> so. Well, I'm very just, 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 into my life real fast, you guys. Okay. Real quick. <laughs> real quick. So at that, that week that I go back home to start packing up, I grab the car and I'm like, screw this. I'm going to my last football practice. I'm going to go pick up my best friend. And you know what? I even went to old lady. Like old to buy a shirt. Oh, she was like, I'm well, out. I don't have a I was, license. I, I don't even literally. care. My mom, they went to work from nine to five. I had eight hours of freedom to go and rebel, go drive to football practice or like what, like everyone stared at me. Like, how does she driving this like convertible car? <laughs> You're not even out of age to have a 
freaking permit. Gift. Yeah, not even of age to have a permit. Oh, it's addiction. So I'm like literally <laughs> oh, like falling at every light. I stopped in the middle of the street because I couldn't go past second gear. No. <laughs> See, oh, you know, I feel you on that. Just so, going neutral right in the middle. And then I go to football practice with my cute new old navy shirt with my best friend riding passenger seat, like yeah. cooler than ever. And I'm like, I'm saying bye to everybody, okay? Yeah. I get to a four-way stop sign and I can't stop the car. Oh <gasps> no. And I'm driving a Mazda Miata. So it's like you, it's Mazda Miata. You didn't know where the brake was or what? I mean, I knew where the brake was, but it wouldn't stop. Oh no, brakes went out, guys. The brakes are out. who knows what happened or like I stalled and smacked into someone but I feel like it was a stall might have been I don't know what happened smacked in the back of this SUV it was a Ford Explorer and I'm in this like little crinkle car and literally crinkled and the like the cops come to me they're like let's see your permit I'm like I left it at home um no she did the I left it at home card they're like, where's your parents? And I was like, uh, at work. They were like, give me the number. I gave them 10 wrong numbers. And they said, mm. if I give them one more wrong number, they are going to take me in to juvenile hall. And I was like, 916, blah, 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 blah. No, <laughs> she, she couldn't hold it together. She couldn't and hold it. She was I like, no, I don't want to. I feel you, though. I feel you. The, the cop, and I'm like, my mom's making me move to Las Vegas, and I just wanted to say goodbye to my friends. And so I took the car, and, and, and my mom and stepdad roll up. My stepdad's, like, trying not to laugh, like, tears of laughter coming down his face. And my mom's, like, screaming at me, like, what happened? Are you okay? And, like, a mom versus, like, get mad. She's, like, first and foremost, am I okay? And her, yeah. like, I'm looking at her car, and, like, the whole – everything is smashed and I'm like I am a jerk I am a jerk but I was that angry because like I'm like how much more could be taken away from me my grandfather's gone I have this strange man I'm literally living in the projects because I don't know what happened at my dad's house you know and and then I'm and then I have to live there like what is happening right (sighs) so then I get to Vegas (laughs) <laughs> oh, I'm in Vegas. Um, anyway, to end that story, you know, I bless my mom's heart, put her through a lot. It was, it was definitely a retaliation. Um, and you know, I just, I'll never forget my stepdad's reaction. He was just, he was laughing because he knew I was doing it. He wasn't mad. They weren't mad. You know, they're probably like this poor child. <laughs> like, you well, know, yeah. I mean, you're getting ripped, you know? And I think that's like with any divorce, you know, it was kind of like you're divorcing your life. It was like you, you'd really didn't, but with the divorce, I kind of feel like it's a choice over like this with kids. Like it's really tough because I feel like with parents, they don't sometimes, and I'm just going to say it sometimes, and maybe because of my own personal experience, the parents are selfish and sometimes they want to take their needs sometimes over their children's and it just kind of, you know, wreaks havoc on the kids and people wonder why like, oh, my kid's acting so bad. Okay. well what did you do to change yeah. things? Like, yeah. why did you do this when things were this way? Like, instead of having a conversation with your child and being like, hey, this is what's going on. I mean, for me, and I guess that's a personal thing. I love being transparent. I'm very transparent with my kid. I'm very transparent in life. I don't like to fluff anything. <laughs> and it is something that, you know, here at Tip Talks, like, we're not going to fluff anything. This is what it is. And yeah. You have to do that. Otherwise, you have a Tiffany out there on her Mazda slamming into SUVs. You know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. I didn't know that. That's so crazy. Wow. That's crazy. She's, I don't think I've even told you that. Like, no, I mean, I've heard this, I've heard your story so many times, but it's like with that, like, I feel like you have those little flashbacks where it's like those little pieces are just so juicy and you're just like, oh, and then I did this and then I did this. <laughs> that's so, so crazy. Yeah. So that's when, um, and I don't even know, like maybe I was a bad kid. Maybe I gave my mom a hard time, but I really felt like life was on track at that time, you yeah. know, but what I now looking back, I think it's because my mom like genuinely wanted me to have some sort of stability until she could figure it out because this one was definitely like, you know, I don't think she knew what she was going to do. And I don't think she wanted me to go through that again. 
you know, like that's all I knew was move, 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 break up, break up, break up, couldn't find the right yeah. guy, you know, and can I couldn't even tell you how many relationships I had gone through with her. And, and I say with her because like, you know, I'm the child and I'm there. I'm with her every step of the way. It's those like, single mom problems, man. It's, yeah. It happens and it, it's tough out there for them single moms for it sure is. because it's, and maybe that's kind of, you had said something in the beginning of this is you were looking for like love in all the different places. And I kind of feel like that equates kind of with your mom. Like she was trying to find love. Like not only was she giving you love, but she was trying to find love for herself too and trying to feel complete as well. So I think that kind of, you know, goes back to the question, like how does that come up in your life? Like I kind of feel like you were kind of searching like, okay, I have this crazy problem. This is what's happening. And I want to, I just want to be loved. Like, I just want to be loved. I want to feel good. And I think that goes with everybody. So, I mean, that's crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah. So fast forwarding to Vegas, now I'm back in Vegas. And now my mom, so the really like shitty part about all of this is the story of how I ended up staying here. And my mom, my dad was paying child support at the time, but she said, it's going to be temporary. Like I just need a few months to get on my feet, mm -hmm. get her into school. So my dad was paying child support. And, um, during all of that, my mom, he asked my mom to write a letter to the school about basically seeing that I, that she gives my dad rights to enroll me into school. He is the, um, you know, basically like the provider or whatever verbiage was used. And he is like guardian kind of thing. Like a guardian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Guardianship. Like in California, it was different, you know, in Vegas. Like I kind of feel like this is going down a really tough path right here when you say that. Oof. Yeah. And so this is where like everything flipped and my whole world was upside down. And during that time, my dad took that letter from what I understand to the courthouses Oh yeah. And he used that to his full advantage. Yep. Pretty much. My mom feels like he kidnapped me and mm. like, tricked her. She said it was only supposed to be temporary. And then there was a whole battle of custody after that point and put me in an awkward position. And then here I am getting brainwashed of like what my mom was and who she was and she's bad and she's this. And, and so I felt like shit later on in life, like absolute shit. Um, and I want to say it up until recently, it took me that long to like, really like see the pain and like, and it's not for me to take on, but it was something that I had resentment over for years. And I, I couldn't see the good in it of, of what she was trying to do, you know? And so anyway, long story short, uh, they, I was filled with just so much like, you know, she did this, your dad met her here before you were born. And you know, this, I don't want to go too deep because as a, a 13 year old girl or 12 at the time when it started with these little things being jabbed into my head, I started to create resentment against my mother. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, ew, like that's who my mom is. And I, I only knew her as the now. And she was like a single mom, always a hard worker. And so, but then like hearing those things, you're like, it was like you were lied to. It was like, what? Yeah. Like, I didn't know any of these things. Like what? Like this, I only know my mom is this. So yeah. And so mm -hmm. like my mom did this and she was that. And like, and then now you have like this whole facade of this like weak woman that who was your warrior, your the strongest woman, you know, and now you hear all of these weak points, these flaws, these things that I shouldn't have known. Yeah. And so it created a resentment of like, ew, I don't even look up to you. Like, who are you? Like, who have mm. you been this whole entire time? You've been fake and blah, 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 whatever stories I created. So when my mom actually drew, drove from California to Las Vegas, keep in mind it's Sacramento. It's like nine to 12 hours of a drive. That's how bad she wanted me to come home. I ran away from her. I ran away from her mm. and I had just started high school Western with you mm -hmm. and she came to come pick me up and I ran. And could you imagine you're a mother, Kylie running away from you and like, mm -hmm. what you feel like, <laughs> I mean, it's really tough. And the only it's tough. And I mean, I can't even really compare it to Kylie because I compare it, I guess, to my own life, um, with my parents and you know, maybe one day we'll talk about it, but, uh, 
you know, it's being told all these things. Like, of course you don't want to do that. I mean, I ran at one point too and I was taken and it was like, Hey, this is where we're at. And I was like, uh, uh, I got my ass on a Greyhound and I was like, Nope, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not doing this. No one's going to stop me. And that was kind of, you know, the short end of it. But well, I guess I, I mean, I would hope that Kylie would never do that. Um, it's just from you know, a mom's standpoint is what mm, I guess. A mom, like, yeah. I from mean, a mom's standpoint, could you imagine your, your child having that much resentment against you? Like taking me out of it, taking you out of it. I'm actually talking about like the actual mother, right? Yeah. You're a mother. I'm not. I'm not a, a biological mother. And imagine your daughter running away from you when you literally have poured your entire life into her. And she's running because you don't know why. <laughs> You're like, what did I do? Like, what did I do? Do you want a soft answer or do you want like the Ferris answer? <laughs> Ferris answer, duh. Um, I would chase her down in my car and I would run her over if I had to. <laughs> <laughs> so um, no, but no, it's as a mom, like I think it would be really tough because thinking of as a mom standpoint and taking our own personal stories out of it. Um yeah it would be like, it would, I guess it would have to definitely be self-reflection. Yeah. It would be like, wow, like, where did I go wrong? Yeah. And, you know, it's maybe some of those things were true. Maybe they weren't true. And I think as mothers, there are some things that we do hide from our kids a hundred percent. Um, and I think it's only natural for either like a protection thing or you just don't feel that they're, they're ready for that truth. Um, yeah, and that's what, that's what a lot of what came up for her. She just, yeah, it was kind of like, okay, well, I didn't tell you because, you know, I didn't want you to, you know, feel a certain way or, you know, it wasn't going to affect you right now. So why tell you kind of thing? And kind of crazy you say that. Cause I'm kind of, my mom, it's similar. It's like, yeah. why talk about it if it's not really affecting you right now? So as from a mother's standpoint, I mean, from a Ferris thing, like I said, I would chase her down <laughs> the car and I'd be like, girl, you get in this car right now. Like, I'm not <laughs> playing no games. I don't care if you hate me get right now, right now. I will chase you down. I am bigger, faster, stronger, but it would definitely be a self-reflecting and it would, um, you definitely have to go down a road of, uh, you know, rediscovery and yeah. forgiveness <laughs> and you know, and being truthful. So, yeah. That's kind of the turning point of our relationship where like, I pretty much chose to stay with my dad because it was a stable environment. Um, I wasn't living on 28th and D street. He actually had a really nice home. Um, at, you know, that whole incident anyway, was just because I think that, you know, blending a family is tough and here was I that the house over there on Michael way. I believe so. When, when hi, <laughs> you guys, when, when street. So if you're from Vegas at all and you know these streets at all so <laughs> she lived on Michael Way and I think it was like almost Jones but it was like in between Jones and Decatur yeah and nice the, house, the house is really really pretty and it had like huge grass it was like this huge lawn and it was really really nice I remember I was only inside one time um <laughs> but I did go to her house one time, so I was just curious if it was that house on Michael Way. No, so, I'm, yes, it was, and you guys, Ferris remembers all of this, but my, so now that we're in my 13 to 16 year life, it was so traumatic for me that it's been blocked out. I don't even remember that. I don't remember a lot of the stories that Ferris tells me, and it's actually really scary because I have a very, very good memory, and I, at some, some point, I've literally stored it somewhere that I'll never remember because it was that traumatic for me. And so from 13 to 16 is when literally life kicked me in the ass, like hard. And here I am, you know, I walk into Western high school um, and I've only known, you know, Catholic school. I actually went to a public school for my freshman year uh, because my best friend went there. I got accepted to a school called Christian Brothers, which was a Christian high school, but I declined the offer because I wanted to go be with my best friend and experience what it felt like to be in like free dress and like regular clothes outfits without a uniform. And yeah. And so, and it was, it was a great experience. Um, but, uh, coming into Western, um, it was a very diverse school. 
I actually grew up with the same 36 kids in my classes. So like every time someone dropped out, which was like never, um, <laughs> but I want to say maybe like three or four kids had dropped out because it took a long time to get into the school. Um, and it was St. Patrick's school, um, in Sacramento, but every time someone would drop out, we would replace it with one child who was on a waiting list. So going into my public school, I still knew most of those kids and, you know, cause it was in the same area. Now going into Las Vegas and going to like a real, real public school, it was like my world was turned upside down. I was the new girl. Um, it was like people, you walked in and I, we were being checked to see if we had weapons on us. And I was like literally shaking. <laughs> Where are all my Western warriors at though? They're listening <laughs> to this podcast right now because like, what's good? Like, no joke warriors. Like now I got why we were Western warriors because I mean, it was a battle just to go to school. I mean, I couldn't even tell you how many people tried to fight me, how many people made fun of me. Or, you know, I was the new girl. I mean, you were mean to me. There was just, I was super quiet. I'm an observer by nature. And I just put my head down on the books and find some sort of, you know, extracurricular activity. And during that time, I enrolled myself because nobody was going to show me. And all I knew was sports and academics at the, at the time. I can't remember if it was the white pages. It wasn't the yellow pages. I think it was the white pages. And I looked for soccer leagues. And it was Silver State Soccer League. And I enrolled myself into it. And I don't remember what happened, but I think I even started a fundraiser so I can afford a uniform. Um, and then I enrolled into Western because back in California, I did two um, softball leagues at the same time. So here I was like, I could totally do a school one and then I can actually do like a competitive league because school isn't the same as competitive. So I did both at the same time and I trade out for cheerleading and that's when I met you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a picture of the soccer team that I'm on. Tiffany's on. It's kind of funny. Um, and now that I think about it, when you tried out for cheerleading, because, okay, so Tiffany's a year older than me, guys. And I mean, I do want to take it back to, I mean, yeah, I was mean because guess what? I had been to Western since I was a freshman. I thought like I was like the shiz. We had this little group called the Fab Four, and it was just like our thing. And here she comes, and she's trying to like slither her way in, I guess. And you know, I was going through a lot of stuff too. So I mean, mindset wise, like I was not nice at all. This was like a full on bring it out moment. Like, I oh, mean, for sure. It was like and the movie I felt like was like written about. <laughs> And you know what, I honestly, so I was just like, obviously regular cheerleading. Um, and I honestly, you guys, I think she made varsity and that's what made me super mad is because she wasn't even on the same team as me. And like, here she comes. And you guys, I know you've seen her ass. I'm just going to say it. It was the same then. So here she comes, this white girl with her blonde hair. She's thin. She's got this little tan olive skin. And then she's like, you turn around and it's like, whoa, what is that? what is that? What is that? And so then she makes varsity and then she's on my soccer team. And I was like, this bitch. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Because I'm going to be honest. I'm center of attention. I'm still like that as an adult. <laughs> like I love being the center of attention. And I felt like the attention shifted to this girl. Oh, have you met Tiffany? Yeah, I've met her. Yes, <laughs> I did. Thank you very much. Like I'm good. She's older, you know, I'm a little bit younger. So it's like, she's hanging out with like, you know, the seniors and the junior guys that like, I've been trying to get at for like the past two years. And they're just like, yeah, Tiffany, come to this party. And yeah, and I'm like, this bitch, I'm like, I'm going to have to do something. So I tried to be her friend guys. I, and we talked about this and <laughs> she doesn't really remember too much because honestly it was very short lived. Um, I really tried to be her friend. She tried to be mine. And I think it came down to like, we were both like, this isn't the vibe, you know, like <laughs> you know, this isn't working for either of us. We're good. We really tried. And it was so forced. I remember <laughs> it being so forced to where it was just like, oh my gosh. Like, and I mean, we went to cheerleading like camps, like when they had it at UNLV <laughs> and you were there and like everybody was there and we really, 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 really tried you guys. And it just didn't work out. So, and then honestly, 
you know, now that she's going through all this and, you know, kudos to you for doing all the things you did and making it through. But um, all of a sudden, you guys, she disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> like, she was there maybe a year, maybe two, maybe. I don't even think two years. And then all of a sudden, she was gone. Yeah. And that was- there was no word of where she went. Is she coming back? Where'd she go? And see, you got to understand, in high school, I mean, it's crazy out there. But, like, I never really asked her her story. You know, I thought her parents were the parents that lived on Michael Way. Like, I didn't know her backstory. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know, like, she had a a real father. I didn't know that, you know, these were her step-parents. I mean, I didn't know any of these things. So, when all of a sudden it was just, like, she was gone. It was, like, uh, I mean, in my mind, to be honest, I was, like, woo, woo. I was, like, (laughs) yes, yes. But then again, it's, like, now I think back and I'm, like, damn what happened yeah and so this is again something that I I don't I don't think I've ever shared um that was a pivotal point in my life where um this was like the last straw because there was so many times that I was pulled out of school um to punish me or I had to start lying about um you know where I was going I, I would say I'd have cheer practice just so I can go and be with friends I was like in a sense I felt like I was like a Cinderella story. I mean, I just remember cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning because at the time, like that was a business that they had. And then my dad is an executive chef at a very large hotel here. And so he, you know, was just angry all the time. And then, um, and he, he admits it, you know, he wishes things were different, but uh, it, it was for me during that time, I was just like, something is wrong. Like I, my academics aren't focused on I had nobody to help me again. Um, here I am in this brand new school. I somehow managed, and I, again, attest to my stepfather at that, that time to get straight A's for, and you know, the ceremonies that they have, but straight A's for the uh, quarter. And they actually hold a very big function um, at the school. And there was only 16 kids in the entire school uh, that actually was able to have straight A's. My parents missed it. My mom would have never missed it. She would have been there with bells and whistles and crying and whistling just because that's who she was. Yeah. I didn't have a parent show up for me. I didn't have anybody there to like say that I'm proud of you. At the time I had a boyfriend. He was the only one that showed up. It was a luncheon for your parents and your children. And I was distraught. And I remember going outside and I was getting picked up and I was like, where were you guys? And they forgot. Mm. And that was like my last straw because they never went to the games. I never had a parent like cheering me on at soccer. Yeah. I never had a parent. Again, if my mom was there, she never missed a game. I mean, I still remember when I was five and I ran off the basketball court to go run and grab a nacho from her. <laughs> like, mm. You know, it was just, she would have never missed it. And seeing like the type of environment, I, I, I just, I didn't, I didn't matter. Yeah. It was clear. Like, that's not genuine love. And that's where I was like, all right, now I'm looking for love in the wrong places. I'm looking for either from friends or from boyfriends or, and I only had one boyfriend at the time. Um, like just that was boyfriends like, with an <laughs> S. Uh, just to clarify, we had one boyfriend, not two, unlike well, like Paris one, running one, around town. Actual boyfriend. And then during that time, My mom, you know, I would still keep in contact with her. She got me a cell phone and I hid it in a sock drawer. And that's so sad. And I mean, I hid my money in there when I got my first job. Um, I hid my cell phone in there because I knew something was going to happen. I just didn't know how. And I was like, in a sense, planning my escape before I even knew it. And I mean, but like legit, like I was literally planning to escape and I didn't know how to get out of this situation other than I started to look up what emancipation meant um, from psychology classes. I started to learn about like the court systems and how that worked. And so I figured it out. I again went to um, my dad at the time because I was lying. I was sneaking out because they would give me a curfew of nine o'clock, this straight A student where I had a stepbrother and a stepsister who Um, you know, I'm not going to go public about this, weren't doing the best of things, but they didn't have a curfew. And I was like, here I am, this really good kid. And I'm always in trouble. I don't understand. But I was like, and then I had a curfew of nine. 
and I couldn't hang out with friends. I couldn't do anything. And I was a straight A student. What? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I'm thinking back to that time, Tiffany, and I just, nine o'clock like nine o'clock like i was getting ready to like go oh. at nine o'clock <laughs> not like it's time to go to bed but all right and yeah how, and did, so how does this all wrap into that's everything? where we're going is yeah. basically we i emancipated myself my mom i had that cell phone i had my money <laughs> and called my mom and said you know i think i'm gonna move in with my boyfriend he was a little bit older than me at the time. We found a loophole and my dad said, basically looked at me in the face. I said, dad, I want to go move in with him and I'm going to be fine. And he looked at me in the face. He said, if you leave this house, I will never walk you down the aisle. And I looked at him and I said, good. And I left. And he oh. said, great. You have my blessing as in I can leave. All I wanted to do was go to school. That's it. Yeah. And so I go to school three days later, and it was, it was a Friday, so Monday, I go back into school, so excited to get my classes going back in school, and we had like my little document that we had signed from the courthouse, and the, I, we had one missing signature, and so me thinking, I'm like, well, here's all of my paperwork, I did everything that I was supposed to be, but I had one missing signature, uh, my dad reported me as a runaway, and so they took me to a detention center, now I'm now fighting, to be emancipated. And all I wanted to do was get out of that house. And long story short, we found another loophole. We went down that loophole. My mom signed off on everything because she's still my legal guardian too, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't know that at the time, the court system. They just saw this as her biological mother. They didn't know that they did that whole chop up in the beginning. Then I was, it was right after my 16th birthday. I'm living on my own with this guy and he's basically my legal guardian with my mom. <laughs> so we then Whoa, moved to the house and that's where my whole life changed. And that's where I started working two jobs. I started figuring out, I mean, I was working at a nightclub at the age of 16. I was hosting at a restaurant. I asked the, you know, nightclub owner if I could do like the guest list and coat check or anything. Like I just started to figure out like how many jobs could I work without killing myself? But I was also 16. I would literally work 24 hours at that point. And so I, from so you just started hustling. You're just yeah. like, I got to hustle. I got to survive. So, I'm on my own. Yeah. Fast forward. I worked myself up all the way to working at the win um, loved it. It was incredible. I was one of the youngest employees there. Um, I worked at the country club as a major D. I then transferred into the tower suite, which then, you know, they loved my customer service, moved me into VIP services, which is handling all of Mr. and Mrs. Wynn's VIP guests from celebrities to, you know, athletes. I can't even tell you how many celebrities I had met from the ages 18 to 21. It was, I mean, Steven Spielberg, Barbara Walters, uh, Oprah, Kobe, LeBron, Shaq, like um, freaking Shia LaBeouf, like everybody you can think of. Like, could you imagine? Like, how on earth did I get out of that situation, work myself up all the way to the Wynn Hotel? Like, there's days where- It's I'm just that, that hustle and heart, baby. It's just <laughs> that hustle and heart, you know what I mean? It's that true, like, grit to where it's like, you got to do whatever it takes. Oh my gosh. And that, that's crazy. Like rest yeah. in peace, Kobe. Yeah. Rest in peace for sure. Solid, solid guy. You know, um, anyway, it was, uh, I'll never forget that day when he passed. It was definitely, um, definitely unfortunate. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a, a great ride, but it's, there was one thing that I just had instilled in me since I was a kid. It was just like, never give up and, and work hard. And, and I, you know, I owe that to my mom because she didn't know what to do with me. So again, I had you, she had me in everything to figure out what I was in love with and what my passion was. And, you know, I working myself up all the way to the win, I quickly knew I had a, a love for serving people, for serving others. I had a really good customer service you know, outlook on life. Like, what can I do for you? I've always been that person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a pivotal point in my life. And obviously, I mean, I, from the age of 18 to 22, like it was 
a lot of like question marks of what am I doing? How, like, I need to have stability. I'm, again, I'm craving stability, but I'm working all of these jobs. Then, um, you know, I, I even went and cocktailed for a few years and that was just stupid money in Las Vegas. I mean, you're making a thousand, two thousand dollars a night. And, right. you know, and so I'm like, this is great money, but I was also probably the shortest retired cocktail waitress you will ever meet. I went in at 21 and retired by 23. It just wasn't for me. I didn't like the nightlife. I didn't like going out. I didn't like outings. I didn't like any of that. And so I transitioned from that and I was actually, um, you know, asked to come and open up a gym. But during that time, I had just gotten into um, competing because during that time, I was actually working with a girl named Noy Alexander at um, Excess Nightclub. And she had a nutritionist and I was like, who do you work with? And for the record, guys, I know that was a big jump, but I went from VIP services at the wind to uh, opening up excess at the wind. <laughs> they asked me to open it up. So, so uh, with meeting this girl that you were yeah. working with over there and she had a nutritionist and everything and what sparked your interest to like ask her, like, were you having problems? Yeah. So I was having dizzy spells. Um, I was always up and down with my weight. Um, I was, gosh, pushing like 148. And on my frame, that's pretty heavy. I'm only 5'2". So I was, in a sense, considered obese. That's according to, you know, I, I don't even want to get into that. That's a whole other story in episode two. Oh, <laughs> right. So even though, like, I was just a little thick, okay, um, I was not feeling good. I had hypoglycemia. I would eat healthy. And then I would, you know, quickly, all of a sudden, gain 10 pounds if I ate one bad meal. So I knew something You'd was like wrong. binge. You'd eat healthy and then binge in a sense. Pretty much. <laughs> so it was uh, me just trying to find a happy medium. And I said, well, I know you always eat super clean. And I wanted her to kind of share with me. And she said she was working with a coach. For women well, at that time? His name was Kim. So that's actually when the IFBB Bikini Pro like division, started. Bikini division. It started right. at the end, right. I believe, in 2009, 2010, I believe. Okay. And I started in 2010. So, I mean, they had just started the division. Nice. Okay. All right. So that's when I was like, um, like not happening, not going to do it. And so sure as I'll get out, I actually stopped cocktailing and I kind of took like a couple of months to just be, I saved up enough money. I needed to get clear. I knew it wasn't, you know, I wasn't going back to cocktailing. I was just, no, that's not going to happen during that time is when I was asked one more time, are you sure you don't want to do a, a competition? I think you would win this sh next show coming up. And I'm like, okay, so what does that look like? So he went through it and boom, I'm doing my first show. And I go in, don't know anybody. I'm by myself again. Okay. So this being by myself at this point, wasn't really like a big deal, like not having parents there, whatever. I'm used to it. Right. Um, Again, if my mom knew, she would be there with like a cheerleader cap. She's just doing it, you guys. She's once again, it's like, it's like a, I'm seeing a trait here. Yeah. And so went and did my show, um, actually really befriended my coach's wife. She kind of was like, in a sense, like my mother hen watching me back there backstage. And I'm just sitting on the ground with like my head pods in, like watching all of these girls, like just run back and forth stressed out. And I'm having a good time. I'm like, I don't know what's happening, but I'm about to go out on that stage <laughs> and own it. And so yeah. I go out there and I think there was like 15 girls. Again, this is my first show and go out there, get first call outs. Didn't know what that meant. And I'm over here shifting positions between first and second, first and second. Again, I didn't know what that meant. And I get off the stage. I'm like, and I go to my coach. I'm like, well, that was fun. And he goes, I think you won. And I was like, no. And so I get called out and I got second place, but still that's great for your first show to be top. Holy smokes. Second yeah. place in something yeah. you, and you were just having a good time. You're like, this is fun. This is great. I feel good. You know, I'm looking good. Like, cool. Oh, wow. That's awesome. So then he looks at me and he was like, so how do you feel about doing a show at Sacramento, my hometown? Whoa, full circle. And I'm like, I wasn't ready to go back. Like I, a lot of stuff started popping up for me because I hadn't been back since. I was 13. So 10 years. Okay. Yeah, so I'm like literally contemplating. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. And so I call my family to come be there, which was like weird. Cause I'd never had my entire actual up. 
the first time I see my mom in like five or six years or something like that. And so I go to that show and now this is like a huge show. This Sacramento pro show is like a V show and it still is to this day. And I there, I go out on stage, you know, do my thing, get off stage and the same thing. I'm like, how did I do? You know, like just so oblivious and naive. Hey, what like, did I get this time? That was fun. He goes, you won. You won. Yeah. They didn't prove you. You won. And I'm like, no, no way. So I come back out. My whole family is there. My like, you know, like my, my real like family, like my, the family. What a moment, huh? You know, and so they called me out and I won. And that's like my most, like, not the Olympias, none of that. Like that one was like the most special show because I had everybody there. And it, it, it gets me emotional hearing you say that because it's like, after everything, all the years, and I can kind of hear it in your voice a little bit. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it was like, you came back home and yeah. you showed everybody like, what's up? I'm doing great. This is who I am. I'm still, yeah. you know, an amazing person despite everything I went through. And this everyone's you know everyone's there cheering you on like I can only imagine like how yeah. you feel like just still today talking about it yeah and you know and for the record to hear my story you guys like that was not easy I mean there was definitely times where like I'm not proud of myself for like you know having the crazy drunk nights and you know drinking but I will tell you I never did a drug um I kept my head in the books I figured life out and, you know, my, my biggest mission with all of this is to show you guys that you can literally come from nothing, come from absolutely no nothing. I mean, I granted, I had like a couple of, um, like struggling moments of, you know, my life. And I also had some incredible wins in life, but you know, I wore the same shoes for eight years and was made fun of. And my mom drove a Geo Metro and, you know, I was made fun of, um, I, I, I hear you on that. And that's, and that's so inspiring. And I think that's what I want people to see is because like, I know you and there are a few people that are really close to you, but like, just because, you know, you go to her Instagram and you go to her pages and, you know, she looks so put together and it's like, it took her a long time to get to this point. It took her, oh, yeah. you know, the struggles of life and for her to climb and for her to respect herself and love herself. And she's done the work you know, and this, it's amazing. And I'm, I just thank you so much for being so vulnerable for all of our listeners and everybody, because this is what it's all about. And, you know, you are a real person. You're not a robot. You're not this <laughs> mystical creature. I know you love being a unicorn and that's fine. We can say she's a unicorn. Um, but you know, that's who she is. Like she has a servant heart from the day I'm sure she was born. And she's just out there, you know, she will hustle. You know, the thing is, okay, I'll say this. She, Tiffany will never ask you to do something that she wouldn't do herself. Yeah. And that's in all areas of life, whether it's business, whether it's fitness, whether it's lifestyle, anything, you know, if she wouldn't ask of you to do it, if she wouldn't do it. So it's, gosh, man, like, I'm, I'm just so glad that, you know, you're able to share that. With people. Yeah, and to like wrap that part up, why it was so important to me is even the girls that were mean to me in elementary school, and like like I was saying, you know, I was made fun of with my shoes. My mom was a single mom driving a Geo Metro. Like, there's just people, especially when you go to a Catholic school, it's the same 36 kids. They know all of your weakness, you know, and they know everything about you. And they were there cheering me on, and it was really just like a moment of like you you made it, like you're okay. You have made it, girl. And I mean, that's that's why the Tiffany Marie Davis brand is being started is because Tiffany wants to show you guys how you can overcome almost anything <laughs> in your life. And if you just keep going and if you just believe and you just keep going and you never give up, like she said earlier, just never give up. And she wants to share all these lovely things with you guys. And um you know, I was going to ask you a few more questions, but honestly, like, I think we, got, I think we got down to it for you. I really think that, you know, behind social media and behind all of, you know, this stuff, like 
this is the true you, that servant person, you know, from a child to, you know, a young tween is what they call it, teen, you know, just the whole from start to finish is just absolutely incredible. And, you know, if I can just ask you one thing to kind of end this, because we're going to be hearing so much more from you and we're going to have so many more interviews and get into certain subjects and things like that. What are you most excited about with launching the Tiff Talks podcast and Tiffany Marie Davis as a brand? Yeah, I'm actually going to back it up because we're not done. <laughs> oh, she's backing it up on me. I'm going to let this go. Guys, we were going to like cap it at a certain point. And the fact that I even went this deep, like I'm not going to do that to you guys. <laughs> I'm going to go just a few, but like we're going to back it up to actually let you guys know, like, yes, that was a very big show. And then I know that I was also one of the fast um, NPC competitors to their pro card um, globally. So after my second show, I then went on to nationals to, to win pro cards. So my third show ever, I was a pro and now I'm competing with girls in the magazines and girls on oxygen. And I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> what just happened? And so I'm looking at these girls and I don't know anything outside of either second place or first place. So I went in like thinking, um, I'm going to go and win my pro show. Like that was like a smack of reality. And that was, you know, I did my first show. I think I got 11th place out of like 35 girls, which was still like incredible. But that was the only time I placed out of the, the top 10 in my entire career, let alone the top six. So that was like a big learning, like humble smack on the butt for a minute. Um, then we catapulted into my entire career and it was like two, three years. Um, I was Mannion, who was the son of the president, uh, JM. I'm sorry, the son of the president at the time, Jim Mannion. Um, he's JM Mannion. And so he had picked the top 26 girls um, in bikini specifically globally. And I was one of them. And uh, ever since then, my competing career just took off. And I didn't take a break for years. And that's all I know. Um, I then at that point in my life was asked to open up David Barton Gym, um, transitioning. And that was really great. It was a corporate position. And I was um, basically of the trainers almost in a sense the assistant gm to the gm um we read an incredible successful journey i was making multiple six figures by the age of 26 i was getting sponsorships i was getting asked to be in magazines i was asked to like write for magazines women's fitness rx i have a lot of articles out there i then became because of my connections you know from the win and everything else and they saw i was into fitness i then all of a sudden started getting celebrity clientele um, I mean, life was like, <laughs> like from all of that to just soaring of choosing a different road and path in my life that I didn't even see coming, but it's because I didn't stop. I worked hard and I literally, if I didn't know something, I figured it out. And, and that was the catapult of everything. And then because I was doing so well, I never take took a break and I didn't know what that meant and I didn't know like what a refeed was after a show so imagine like I was in a deficit for probably like three years of and I was over training and under eating and I didn't know that so my health took a big toll starting to like I had intolerances with everything I had celiac I my thyroid crashed um I didn't have a period for three years and I was told that this was normal Definitely not normal. And <laughs> I was, it's just fine. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. And then I qualified for the Olympia. I then was, you know, asked to go and compete with, uh, I was invited to the Arnold Classic, which is to me, I mean, I love the Olympia, but I feel like the Arnold is a very prestige invitation because you are chosen. Only 16 girls are chosen out of the entire world to come and compete for the Arnold Classic. And that I, I got first call up. That was incredible. And I was like, whoa, you know, and I'm Natalia Mello, Amanda Latona, like the, the, like the bikini competitors. And, uh, you know, it was like a dream come true at that point, you know? And so then I go into the Olympia and I'm noticing that like, now I'm like 98 pounds, like something's not right. My muscle starting to like eat itself. And I was my last three shows, um, I was asked to do one in, in San Diego and it was literally 
another traumatic experience. Um, I was called to do, uh, I was basically chosen to win the show, um, just based off of the odds, competitive career, you know, all of that. I was called out for first call outs. They had a switch in the middle. And this was right before the 2013 Olympia, and this was in August. And RX Muscle, everybody, as soon as I came off stage, they're like, looks like Tiffany Marie Boydston is winning the show. And they pulled me off stage to give me an interview. And I was like, yeah, you know, I just, you know, we'll see at finals tonight and blah, 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 blah. And we get, we get down to finals and I'm not even called out for first call outs. And I'm like, well, what happened? Prior to that, I actually heard my coach um, saying some things about me, about the way that my presence was and what was happening to another competitor that was on my team. And I was like, that's not good. And I remember getting in the car and I'm like, I heard everything you said. And Whoa. yeah, I'm not calling them out or anything, but I am just being honest as to why, mm -hmm. you know, I had to call my career because that sense of trust was gone. Yeah. And I literally put my entire life into this person's hands to hear like that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, from the age of 22 until 26, like, that's a huge chunk of my life that, you know, I, I listened to everything to do to win, you know, yeah. and hearing that it was like, I'm done, you know, so I'm done. I knew I was done. And after that show, I placed six, which was not like after being in the center, when you're in the center, you're either taking first, second, or third. That's just how it is to be called out six. What happened? like what I'll never know the answer and so I remember getting on the phone with my manager and he actually was like really really great about everything he's like don't worry kiddo we're gonna fix this he's like you're gonna go to St. Louis I'm gonna call your coach we're gonna get it figured out next thing I knew I was on a plane and I was going to St. Louis and there was a stack of like 42 girls I mean that's huge that's a huge huge show and I get out there um and it's between me and Justine Monroe. And if anybody knows who Justine Monroe is, that girl is a horse. Like she's perfect. <laughs> her mm. legs and her glutes. I'm just like, you know, and sure enough, in order for me to qualify, I had to get first or second. And so I'm like, mind, mind is all over the place. Like, I don't know, like just going to go out there and crush it. And, uh, I get there, I get second place qualified for the Olympia. I go home for two weeks. And I just get to like reset for a little bit, but you can't break because the Olympia is right around the corner. So I remember every single day I was doing sprints and I was crying and because I knew I was done. The passion was gone. My trust was gone. My everything, my health was gone. My thyroid was crashing. I did. I wasn't even like legal or not legally, but on paper, I was as old as my mother. Um, you right. know, 26 year old body on paper. I was basically going through menopause. And so that's where at the Olympia showed up, you know, the best I'd ever looked personally. It's just the personal preference of where I was at mentally. And I cracked the top 10 and I felt that that was a good time. Like, you know, I, I, I made the top 10 in the world. I'm, I'm going to hang up my shoes. I'm going to hang up my heels. And uh, I wrote a letter to my manager and he was like, you know, he called my coach and he was like, what happened? You know, he knew, he knew something was up and, he goes, this miss, he goes, you don't just write a letter like this without like some sort of like premeditation. I, I just had had it. Like my health was in the toilet and everything was just, it was done. So, but then it literally spiraled me into, you know, during all of that, I was, my head was in the book with alternative integrative nutrition. I wasn't finished yet, but, um, you know, before I had retired, I, I was on track to really learning the body. And then I like projected it into everybody that I knew. So I felt like I went through all of that instead of like being resentful towards it. I feel like I went through all of that to be able to teach others what not to do and how to do it in a way where you can still have a lifestyle and live your life and be healthy. You know, and since then I've actually been able to reverse everything. My hormones are perfect. I am on thyroid medication. However, um, it is very managed. And for the first time in seven years, I've been able to take down my, um, my doses because I'm now in the nutraceutical space where, you know, we have bioavailable nutrition and you guys can find that on the website. But 
that was something that really catapulted me into this wealth of knowledge because my head went into the books to really figure out what I had just done to my body and how to never do that again and to teach others how to do it the right way. So going to who I am today, um, I call myself a corporate dropout because, <laughs> because of, uh, during that time, David Barton was incredible, but it got, uh, actually someone bought out David Barton and, uh, they kept the name, but it was another, another club. It was Meridian sports club and everything that I had built, you know, we had created mul like a multi-million dollar personal training platform. And, um, you know, here I am making multiple six figures. Life is great. And then another company comes in and they pull a rug from underneath us. And, um, you know, I was also working with just one client at the time. He actually, um, had me as his exclusive trainer. He, uh, he's a, a very well-known poker player. Um, his name's Daniel Negreanu. I worked with him for about four years. It was incredible. So during that journey, it was a really great ride. I loved life. Life was amazing. And as soon as I came in, salary dropped, insurance was done. All of our agreements that we agreed with prior to were out the window. And I was like, okay, here I go again. Corporate, literally, like you just spent your entire, like thinking that you're going to go another level and another level up. Nope. They can do whatever they want to. And since then, I have never been psychologically employable from that day forward. I then started my entrepreneurship. I, um, you know, I went to another gym. I didn't know what to do. I had all of these like certifications under my belt, didn't know what to do. And I had this license to, you know, with nutrition and, and master training. And then basically I felt like I had to take a step down to take a step up. But in reality, I took a step down to take that step up. And so looking at like when I went back on the training floor, I actually went to a different gym so I can, cause that looked like I would make more money doing that as an independent contractor. Um, but I also didn't have corporate backing me up. So people would cancel, um, you know, and people didn't realize that oh, this is her livelihood. I should really either show up or pay for a cancellation fee. So it taught me a lot. Um, but I was also looking for a space to either have a facility or, you know, run nutrition consults out of it. And all I kept hearing was a hundred thousand, 200,000, 300, hundred thousand to do this. And I'm like, where am I going to get that right now? You know? And so actually during that time, network marketing found me. And it's even like crazy to say that because, you know, I have godparents in my life and I call them my parents to this day. Like during all of this, I know my story is like all over the place kind of, but it's, that's, that was my life. Um, you know, my early late teens, early twenties, my godparents came into my life and really put their hands around me and just taught me what it was like to have parents. And she's just a wealth of knowledge and nutrition. That's actually how I got started into it. Um, and so during that transition, I, uh, I knew what network marketing was from her, but I never wanted a piece of it at all. I'm like, Oh, that's a pyramid thing. That's stupid. Like no way. And so finally it got to a point where I saw this couple in a gym and I'm like, what the heck do they do? Like they're always here. They have free time. He's a doctor. She's a retired personal trainer. They seem like they crush it. They're a nice couple. And they introduced a network marketing company to me. I'm like, nope. And so it took me like three months to even say yes, but I got to a point where it hurt so bad. And I don't know if you guys can, can relate to this, but when things start to hurt so bad and you've literally done everything and you're like, what's the worst thing that could happen at this point? All right, sign me up. You know, I could leverage where I was at in my life. It was perfect. People wanted to lose weight. You know, it was a shake company. It was, you know, all of the ingredients checked off of my list. Um, so it was a great run. You know, I, I helped a lot of people um, lose weight and then also it leveraged my time. It was incredible. I was able to have, uh, you know, like meal plans that I didn't have to spend four to five hours on that would already be, you know, in conjunction with, with this company. So it just worked, right? Well, three years of that, there was a lot of ups and downs. Um, and I was always in that like mindset, just don't give up, don't give up, keep going. But it became a, like a toxic environment one. And then two, on top of that, it, there was like, um, not just a toxic environment, but you also get into network marketing to serve others. And, and that's where I quickly like realized the model. It's not about you. It's about how many people can you serve? How many people can you help get you know, some income into their home and what can you do to really help give this vehicle to people? And so I started to like fall in love with the model and I still love it to this day. 
Um, but you know, I'm no longer with that company. And actually I, I joined forces with another company just five months ago and you know, I'm planning my flag. I'm done. <laughs> Network marketing is definitely something that, you know, it's, it's not built for the week. That's for sure. And in a sense, anybody can do it as long as you don't give up. And that's where we, we as a team make sure that that happens. And so what took me three years to build in that prior company, I was able to replace in this new one in three weeks because of the support, the love, the, you know, the, the team environment. Like I finally found a place where, you know, we're in the nutraceutical, nutraceutical space where we're helping people from an overall like standpoint of wellness and they don't have to change their diet. They don't have to do any of that. So that's been, you know, what's been new, but I just never, ever, ever gave up. And, and that's a huge part of my story, which then, you know, thankfully I said yes to this company because now it's been my vehicle that's been helping get me to the next level of what we're creating today is Tiffany Marie, you know, Davis.com. And I, I believe it's Tiffany Marie dash Davis.com. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, and you know, that's, you know, and I, I definitely jumped the gun on my little last part there. Cause I mean, a lot of that's super important because it, there's, and whoever's listening, there's a trend in your life. And until you broke that trend. So it's like you do all these things, even as a kid, you're in the books, you're doing this, you get failed by the system. You know, you're trying to get emancipated, get away, get safe, failed by the system. Yeah. And then it's like into your, into your life, you know, you start figuring out like, nutrition and you're going up on the ladder here in Vegas and it's like your coach in a sense failed you you know mm -hmm. it's then then you go into the you know nutrition space to where it's like you're finding out all these things and you're getting licenses and stuff and it's like then your body failed you and then you know you go and you're at the gym and you helping people and you're a fitness trainer and then corporate failed you and it's like all of these things have failed you in your life except yourself Mm -hmm. and that's why entrepreneurship is your thing because it's you who sets the tone yeah. sets the tone for everything and I love how you said it's like network marketing is not for everybody and I think just entrepreneurship in general I don't think it's for everybody because it's with you Tiffany and your story it's so perfect because it's like now you're setting the tone for everything because you know damn well you ain't gonna fail you Mm -hmm. everybody else has failed you at one point or another, but you're not going to fail you. And I think that's a huge thing of why Tiffany Marie dash Davis.com and her <laughs> brand is, uh, is here is to share all of those things and all of these things that you do. And that's just another way of you serving. So yeah, gosh, that, that was incredible. I mean, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah. So, I mean, during all of that, you know, the, especially with the three years of the prior company, you brought a lot of gifts. You know, you came back into my life. Ferris was actually, she reached out to me on Instagram and she was like, you know, you're a force to be reckoned with. I want to know what you're doing. I have a wedding coming up. Can you help me? And absolutely with wide open arms, no questions asked. I said, yes. Please. I was so scared. You guys, like <laughs> I hadn't talked to her. So, you know, she talks about her story and she talks about like all of the things that she just went over in this podcast. And I had saw, I saw her on social media and I saw all those pictures and I saw her go through all of those things. And I saw her at the gym and at Barton and training people. And I was just always like, dang, like, look at her, like, look where she's at now. And, you know, it was crazy because I hadn't seen her in years and I was at a really low point and I was just like, well, she works at a gym and she posted on her story. This is why stories are really important guys. <laughs> she said, I have one more spot available for training. I was like, oh, and it, that's funny that you say like you're a force. Cause I remember saying that. And I remember saying like, I know we didn't get along. And I was like this little mouse, like, I'm so sorry, but like, will you talk to me? <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, well, I know she'll remember me, but it could, you know, it could have went one or two ways. You could have been like completely ignored me because of how nasty I was or the road that you took, you were like, yeah, we'll try it out. Let's see what this is all about. And I mean, it's been, it's been pretty crazy since then. Well, 
I did a lot of personal development during that time as well. You know, with Daniel Negreanu, he actually introduced me to a program called Choice. And it's actually where, you know, a lot of my walls were torn down and my limited beliefs, believe it or not, even though working myself all the way up, like had I had that course before, who knows where I would have been, you know, but it, it took me from 26 until 30 to, to really like understand what personal development was, investing into yourself. Um, and I really learned forgiveness because if you listen to my story, like you said, that was powerful, Ferris. Thank you for making me aware of that. But yeah, I didn't even realize it, but everything had fell on me except for me. And I had control over that. And so in a sense, like I kind of became like a perfectionist. And if you guys do Enneagram, I'm a one, like well, the freaking most perfectionist person. Number one. <laughs> She's no, number like, one, ladies and gentlemen. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, number one. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh goodness. Oh, but no, it's, it's actually like a blessing and a curse because perfect is not real. You know, it's, it's not real. And, uh, anyway, I learned forgiveness. And when you reached out, I had already done the work. And so no matter what you said or did, there was nothing that you could do. I was bulletproof, you know, like I was right. good. I was physically good. I'm, I'm a stronger woman now because of everything I'd gone through. And so who am I to not say, Hey, you know, it's always going to be between you and God. It's not going to be between me and you. It's up to him to decide what's going on and then for me to always forgive because who am I to not forgive, right? If God and, and Jesus can die for all of our sins, I can forgive. So that was a big thing in my life where I was in a state and you had just come in at the right time and you guys, she couldn't even do a lunge and now she's one of the strongest. The women. fact that you can, don't, no, okay. No, sure. we're, we're taking that out. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, for real though, I was like, it was bad. It was really, oh, really bad. I to brag about you for a second, okay? Because I know she's like blushing right now and she just put herself on mute. So anyway, Ferris comes to me. She can't even do a lunge, okay? We've built a solid relationship since. We've created a, a relationship of trust and love. And, you know, there's not many people that you can say can do that for you nowadays. And like, you know, her and I have gone through a lot and she lost 65 pounds for her wedding. I, I'll still never forget it. I walked into, I'm going to cry. Um, I walked into her dressing room and I was just like, my God, you're gorgeous. And I just remember like the hard work, the blood, the sweat and the tears. Like we were even battling sometimes. Like, I'm like, do you want to go home? Like, do you really want to go oh home? Oh my gosh. We got into it one time, guys. I was like, yeah. why am I even here? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, you're painting me because I don't want any babies. I don't want you to steal the show. You're here to do work. And we've got work to do. Like I'm a tough coach, but I always do it from a place of love because it's for you. It's not for me. Right. And so, you know, we, man, I mean, our relationship went from a zero to like a three to a five. I mean, now we're like at a 30. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't think yeah, it's, it's pretty love. intense now. And you guys will see on these episodes. It's uh it just transitioned into so many things. And, you know, I think from knowing each other and knowing that we both had struggles and knowing that like where we're at now, like we were able to get past that. And, you know, I needed help and I needed some serious help. And, you know, Tiffany provided that. And that is, I mean, it's another reason why, you know, all of this kind of started is because it's just, we need it. We want to help people. Tiffany wants to help people. You know, I want to help Tiffany. And it's this idea of a podcast and this idea of a brand and all these things over the last two and a half years have now come to fruition. And, uh, I mean, if I can say anything, I always tell her that I am forever indebted to her because mm -hmm. I could never, the amount of things she has done for me and shown me to bring me to where I'm at now is if I had never reached out to her that day on right. Instagram. And if I had never, you know, if I would have stuck in my shell and been like, you know, been in that mindset of, Oh, that's just a girl from high school. You know, you never know what could happen. And it's just so incredible. I'm getting emotional even thinking about that, you guys, because I'm, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to totally go into, I can't believe I even got, and we're getting this deep, but <laughs> I love it. Um, this is what it's all about. This is what Tiff Talks is about. You guys, like, we don't want to be those people that say, hey, real talk, like real talk. Like, why, why do we have to say real talk? When will you ever not be real? Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's always be real. <laughs> but, I, I really feel like people have like their own, everyone's going to judge everybody, but I feel like because of where you've come from, 
you know, you don't show a lot of that hardship because why? Because there's so much good. Like why, why resonate on the bad? Yeah. And I agree with that. And I think it's, you know, to all the haters or the naysayers or whoever it is, like, you know, Tiffany's a real person. And I've said this before earlier on this exact podcast, like she's, you know, a real person that has feelings and emotions and, you know, just because she looks a certain way, like doesn't mean that she hasn't gone through things and that she doesn't have a soft heart and she doesn't care and she's unapproachable or whatever it is. So it's like, that's why I wanted to get down into it. And I'm so glad. And this is going to be super long for everybody, but I really, really want people to know like what I know on an everyday basis, because it's only fair. It's only fair for them to know, like, this is what the real deal is and what to expect, what's to come. And yeah, uh, back it up. I can believe it's happening, honestly. I, and it's been years in the making, Ferris and I have been talking about this and we've just built that trusting, loyal relationship and even just in two years. And, but if you think about it, we've had 18 years, you know, we're just catching up. Right. So, but the Ferris that came to me, you guys that couldn't even do a lunge, let me just tell you her mindset and who she is today in just the last two years has completely shifted. When she says that she's indebted, you know, like for me, I feel the same way because she also does so many things on the back end. You know, she's created this website. She does everything on the podcast and helping me. She helps literally harmonize my life. And it got to a point where, you know, in a sense I empowered her and said, Hey, you're doing all this stuff for free. You should make a business of it, you know? And so Ferris, as you know, it two years ago, still had those negative beliefs, those limited beliefs. And now the Ferris you guys see is her language has, you know, changed. And, you know, even people in her circle are like, ew, you've changed. And it's like, good. You don't want to stay the same. Like we will always have the hood in us. Right. <laughs> but we're the OG not- is still there, you know, I mean, <laughs> obviously, does, but it it's doesn't need to come out <laughs> to, yeah, you have to evolve. And honestly, it's like, I got to a point where like, I didn't like myself at all. And I didn't want to stay there any longer. I didn't want to stay that way any longer. And I, this is like going to be a whole nother hour that we could go into it, but I just didn't want to be that nasty person anymore because at the heart of it, like I love helping people just like you do. Like I've been through a lot in my life and you know, you rebelling, driving that car, the beginning of the story you know, for me was being mean to people because that made me feel better. Well, if I could be mean, then great. So it's, you know, (laughs) it's just so much, you guys, so much. We'll have an episode with you, don't you, (laughs) right? Yeah, we'll get to it. But um, one last question. I just want to ask one last question and then that'll kind of be the ending to this incredible first episode of tip talks podcast. You guys, (laughs) what is your biggest fear in life moving forward now? Staying stagnant, you know, and I'm always like, if you listen to my story, like I don't like staying stuck. I like growth and you know, we did a podcast the other day and we asked someone, you know, someone the same question. I'm not going to spoil it for everyone, but, um, staying average, you know, that, that was a big thing for me. And that's the same thing as falling within staying stagnant, you know, just doing everyday life. Like in what, what movie is that? Is it Ferris or is it? No, it's not Ferris. <laughs> what is that? Where you said like, Ferris Bueller's uh, day off yeah, with the butterfly effect. Well, yeah, I mean, where you keep reliving the same. Yeah, it's the or Groundhog Day. I mean, that's yeah, kind of what 2020 has been like is Groundhog Day. <laughs> like all of it, right? Like living the same life day in and day out, someone telling you what they think is best for you, even if it's a spouse. You know, like I won't, and I know it drives like my nuts, but like, I'm, I have all of these crazy ideas every two years. I'm like, it's like, it's like my car. Like I have to have a new car every three years. Like I don't like having the same thing because or doing the same thing because you're not changing. And if you're not changing, you're not growing. So that's a big, big thing for me is I don't want to be average and stay stagnant. Like that's a fear of mine and, and not, um, in a sense, because it makes me feel, and, and this is my Enneagram one, is it makes me feel like I'm not living to my full potential and I'm not in a sense like 
not saying that I'm not good enough, but I also, I have those like conversations of I'm not doing enough to be my full potential. And so I just, my biggest fear is staying stagnant and being average. And that's, well, you're definitely not staying stagnant. You're (laughs) definitely not average. I hope you guys all enjoyed this podcast and our first episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you're watching the replay on YouTube, it's going to be tons of fun. We're so excited to have more and more guests to come, more episodes to come, more of Tiffany. And thank you again so much. We love you guys. Stay blessed. Stay tuned for the next episode. Bye.